All right, welcome, welcome. So today's lecture is uh, the first one of uh, the next module on uh, population genetics and disease genomics. So today we're talking about uh, population genetics. And then on Thursday, we're going to talk about disease associations. Next Tuesday, about quantitative trait mapping. And then uh, next Thursday, on missing heritability and polygenicity. So the, um, the goal for this set of modules is to basically start understanding uh, the fundamentals of human variation and how we can then exploit that to both understand something about our ancestry as a species, about what matters in our genome, and about the regions that are associated with different types of disease. So uh, for today, we're going to basically start with uh, understanding the basis of genetic variation in the human population. What are uh, common polymorphisms? What are the different types of polymorphisms? How do we detect them? And how, we de how do we call them from sequencing reads? Then we're going to talk about uh, haplotypes and recombination and linkage to equilibrium and phasing, basically going beyond individual variants to how these variants are co-inherited. Then we're going to talk about human relatedness and uh, ancestry, something that's been in the news lately. And then we're going to talk about human demographic history. So how did we you know, get out of Africa and populate the world? And then how do we use uh, population genomics to actually start measuring human selection at uh, multiple scales? So let's start with identifying and measuring uh, genetic variation. So as you know, between any two people in this room, just like any two people in this planet, we are 99.9% .9 identical. It's, it's incredible just how closely related humans are to each other. Um, but there's two ways to seeing this. We still have 3 billion nucleotides. If we are 99% you know, identical, that basically means that there's still millions of differences between us. Uh, so what are these differences? These are the differences, I mean, the vast majority of these differences are uh, benign. They don't do anything. They, you know, simply are passengers uh, and then, you know, they don't have any phenotypic consequences. This is largely the vast majority of our genome is actually not functional. It's, you know, it doesn't matter if you change it or not. But then uh, the remaining, um, you know, differences are in fact the ones that actually explain a lot of our predisposition to different diseases to you know, different phenotypic uh, signatures and so on and so forth. And then of course, there's a lot of remaining phenotypic variation between us. Not all of it is genetic, a lot of it is environment. So basically, you know, I will look very different if I stay in the sun for hours uh, at a time, or if I eat you know, 10 times more than I'm currently eating and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of sort of phenotypic uh, differences that arise from the environment. If I sleep next to a nuclear power plant or an electric plant and so on and so forth every night, you're going to start seeing differences in you know, all, all kinds of ways. Uh, so anyway, so what are the genetically driven uh, you know, variants that explain part of that phenotypic difference? On one hand, we have um, the most common uh, variant. It's basically single nucleotide polymorphisms. Why is this the most common? Because when a DNA polymerase goes along happily copying DNA from one cell to the next, in the germ line that basically gave rise to uh, you know, modern humans, it basically makes a mistake every now and then. And it is very common to make a mistake that replaces one nucleotide by another nucleotide, just because it basically misread one of those nucleotides. And there's about one such single nucleotide polymorphism every thousand bases in the human genome. So uh, everybody comfortable with SNPs? Oh, you guys have heard of a lot of them. So another type of variation is indels. That's when polymerase, instead of just making a mistake in one nucleotide, it basically inserts a bunch of nucleotides. So instead of C, in this particular case, it might insert uh, C, of course, and then T, A, T, G, G. That's basically an indel. Some individuals have you know, five extra bases here. Some individuals don't. Here I'm repeating the C to basically make it look like an indel rather than you know nothing and then that polymorphism. And there's about one such indel every 10,000 bases. Another very common mistake that polymerase makes when it copies uh, DNA 
is um, when it has a stretch of repeating tamers, very often of length two or three or four, it will end up making more copies than it should. This is uh, known as slipping. So basically, as it's copying along, it's like, you know, it's aligning itself on the wrong uh, triplet and it's inserting or deleting some of those triplets. And these are uh, known as short tandem repeats. And then there's, and there's the, their frequency is roughly the same as that of indels. And then there's structural variants and copy number variants. And these are dramatically more impactful. These are much larger deletions, duplications, or inversions, whose median length is about 5,000 nucleotides. And there's one of those every uh, uh, million basis. Everybody, everybody comfortable with uh, this so far? So uh, let's turn a little bit to single nucleotide polymorphism. So um, you know, here's one such example where basically this happens in the middle of a protein coding region. And you have <clears throat> the second nucleotide uh, of the uh, codons, EGAG, that codes for glutamic acid, it basically changes into a T, changing the codon to a GTG, which is not a synonymous change, and that basically results in a valine being inserted instead of glutamic acid. So, you know, this might have no impact if that region of the protein is not uh, important. Or, in the case of sickle cell anemia, this uh, will actually have a dramatic impact phenotypically where basically your uh, blood, red blood cells, will very often have this sickle cell uh, phenotype. And this mutation is actually remarkably common in the human population. Do you guys know where it is more common than in other places? Exactly. So exactly where you find malaria. So basically in sort of uh, West Africa and Middle Africa, you basically have um, a lot of this uh, sickle cell anemia. And in fact, the range of sickle cell anemia is exactly overlapping the range where malaria has been historically found, indicating that in fact, this seemingly, um, you know, uh, bad mutation was in fact extremely good in that uh, environment. So again, this example goes to show that, um, you know, risk and non-risk is always phenotype dependent. If you're talking about malaria, the protective allele is uh, GTG. If you're talking about single cell uh, anemia, then the protective allele is actually GAG. Okay? Basically, uh, and also at different points in time, uh, something that might be very beneficial, for example, storing a lot of uh, calories from your daily intake, uh, might actually become very detrimental because what used to make you survive famines is now making you chubby and have type 2 diabetes and all kinds of other bad things. So these are single nucleotide polymorphisms. There's basically um, a huge focus on SNPs because they're very easy to measure. And they have been the workhorse of genome-wide association studies, eGPLs, and so on and so forth. Very frequently, we will assume that every SNP has exactly two alleles. You know, if you have a GAG and a GTG, chances are you don't also have a CG, uh, CG or a G, um, GG. And the reason is because these polymorphisms arose very early in human ancestry. And because the genome is so big and because there's actually so few of these mutations, it's very uncommon to find multi-allelic uh, SNPs or generally multi-allelic variants at the same locus. Does that make sense? So basically most of the time we're gonna be assuming that there's only one of those uh, alternatives. So there's only two versions. They're uh, very common, so they've been cataloged. So instead of uh, basically saying, oh, you know, this polymorphism at position, you know, so-and-so of this chromosome, we're gonna be saying, you know, this is the particular variant. It's gonna have an RS ID. And there's databases that have basically cataloged all these variants. And, you know, you can sort of look them up systematically. More than 100 million uh, known variants already in GDP. Uh, and, you know, they, of course, range greatly in frequency. So we're going to be talking about common variants at more than 5% frequency. Low frequency variants between 0.5 and 5% frequency. We're going to be talking about rare variants if they're less than 0.5% frequency. 
And some of those will only be found in one person. And those we will de uh, uh, define as either private or de novo variant. You can't quite calculate a frequency just because you know it's very small, but you can't quite estimate it because when you get to these numbers, um, the denominator is not very uh, stable. And then, uh, you know, it gets worse than that. Uh, we're now actually starting to study somatic variants. So this is not even one person. So basically, this is a variant that arose during the cell divisions that gave rise to one person. So in my brain, there are mutations that happened as my cells were dividing to give rise to you know, the full organism. And some of those mutations are in fact predisposing me to you know, disease or you know, sometimes leading uh, to different phenotypic outcomes. Everybody cool with this? So uh, now how do we distinguish the two alleles? So basically, you know, how do we refer to the T versus the A? We talked about risk and non-risk. Uh, you know, that's again, phenotype dependent. So you can't always say, oh, the risk version. So in fact, there's many ways of distinguishing them. One of them is to basically talk about reference allele versus alternate allele. Why? Because there is a reference human genome out there. There's some dude from Buffalo that basically became the reference human genome. He's no different than you and me from any of us. But if you happen to have the same allele as that random person, then you have the reference allele. If you happen to have a different allele than that person, you have an alternate allele. Very often, the reference allele will be the common allele, just because it's more likely that that person had the common allele. But sometimes that reference allele from the human genome reference will actually be the alternate allele. So that's one way of distinguishing the two alleles, reference versus uh, alternate. Another way, it, and that's completely unambiguous because there's only one reference human genome and that's it. Another way to do it is to basically discuss major and minor allele. That's not as biased because this reference genome, I mean, so what? You're the same as that reference uh, human genome in that position. That doesn't say anything about your phenotype, its history, whether you're associated with disease and so on and so forth. Another way to do it is to talk about major and minor allele. So basically, if you know, that allele is at 50% at like, I don't know, 80% of the population, and the other allele is at 20% of the in the population, we're going to talk about sort of the major allele and the minor allele. Okay? There's a problem with that, which is that in different populations, the major allele will differ. So basically, you know, in Africa, the major allele might actually be the minor allele in Europe. Yeah, yeah, we, we have stored a few uh, versions. Um, and, and that's why having RSIDs is extremely important because, you know, if you realize that, you know, you have to include a few more nucleotides, you don't have to change all of the reference SNPs, you have to just simply update your database of RSIDs. The other way to uh, distinguish the two alleles is to talk about the ancestral versus the derived allele. So basically, if you go to the most common ancestor between uh, you know, uh, different humans, you can basically look at chimp and basically ask, is this uh, is one of the two versions matching uh, the chimp, right? This won't always be the case. Some places, the chimp simply has no ortholog. In other places, both of them are actually different from chimp and so forth. And in other cases, um, you know, Basically, we may not have access to that uh, information. Or it might also be uh, heterozygous in chimps as well, although this is very unlikely because uh, most human genetic variation arose very, very recently. And therefore, um, yeah, these SNPs will not be shared. And then, of course, as I mentioned in the previous slide, you can also distinguish the two alleles based on their disease association, but that is very disease dependent and very phenotype dependent and very environment dependent. Okay? Everybody with me so far? Great, so basically here's one example, here's the SNP, here's the reference allele, here's the minor allele, and the ancestral allele is not a, a known uh, for reference. All right, the other thing to realize is that uh, common alleles have, um, really not very helpful, it doesn't hide, uh, generally small effects. So if you look at the 2D scatter plot of allele frequency, whether something is you know, common, rare, or private, versus effect size 
whether something will have a strong impact on a phenotype or a weak impact on any phenotype or sometimes no impact, then what you're going to realize is that there's this inverse relationship. Basically, most common variants that have typically been discovered in genome-wide association studies have generally very, very small effects. By contrast, variants that have strong effects, such as, you know, two-fold higher risk or three-fold higher risk or higher, um, they're actually very, very rare. So why is that? Anybody want to take a guess? That's exactly right. Yeah. Want to phrase it in evolutionary terms? Yeah. Sorry? Lower fitness. Yeah. Yeah. Selection. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So basically, mutations happen completely by chance along this effect size spectrum. Those mutations that are quite benign, evolution will tolerate them so they can rise to high frequency. Those mutations that have strong detrimental effect sizes, evolution will notice them quite rapidly. And these individuals will either die directly or have fewer children or generally have lower fitness over uh, generation. Okay? And that basically leads to this inverse relationship where you know, those strong effect detrimental variants are simply not allowed to rise to high frequency. Okay, and then there's very few examples of high effect common variants that influence common disease. And one such example is sickle cell anemia. And the reason for that is because they were actually selected for and rose at high frequency in a different environment. Now, when you put them in a new environment, they are actually detrimental. And on the other side, rare variants of small effects are actually uh, simply impossible to, to recognize. So there, you know, there's probably plenty of those uh, that have you know, very small effects and are simply rare. We just don't know about them just because they, they don't rise in you know, the, our detection thresholds. Sounds good? Yeah. So the way that you define the effect is by basically looking at individuals that have one version or the other version of a particular, you know, uh, SNP. And then you basically ask those people that have, say, the risk version of the SNP, how much sicker are they? They're, you know, how, how, how much more frequently do they show the disease? And if they have three times the frequency of the disease, Yeah, so, so there's very few variants that influence height by a lot. But how do you define the effect on height? In a quantitative trait like height, you basically measure a bunch of individuals that have you know, one version, another version. You may see uh, you know, broad distribution, but then their means might be offset by one millimeter. And then you can say, well, that variant has a one millimeter effect on phenotype. Very difficult to quantify. In any one person, simply having that variant doesn't necessarily mean that that person will have, you know, one millimeter more or less height, but, you know, the effects are actually that small. It's quite crazy. I mean, what's crazy is that we can detect them, not that they have small effects, but we can detect such small effects. So you can basically now ask, what kind of methods do we use to discover variants at different ranges? And then we're going to talk about both linkage and association in the next lecture for actually discovering uh, common variants or rare variants. And that's very highly dependent on their effect size. Okay. Today we're focusing mostly on SNPs, much more than sort of the disease association aspects. So beyond SNPs, uh, we mentioned tandem repeats and also indels. So uh, here's one example of a variable tandem repeat. In the Huntington gene, you basically have uh, CAG, 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 you know, a bunch of times. Those individuals who have nine or 10 or 12 copies of these triplet repeat are perfectly fine. Those who have more than 30 have Huntington disease. And that basically leads to an abnormal protein, which actually damages neurons, leads to brain cell death, 
changes initially in mood and coordination, ultimately speaking, and ultimately dementia and death. So again, these look you know, like they're tolerated, but then as soon as you go beyond a certain level, you have a huge, huge uh, phenotypic consequence. Here's another example of uh, cystic fibrosis. So basically a, de a deletion of three nucleotides, an in-frame deletion in the CFTR gene, is in fact changing uh, that protein. It can no longer uh, act as the uh, transmembrane conductance regulator that it normally uh, carries out. And it basically leads ultimately to a uh, much more secretion of um, mucus and infection and uh, cysts fibrosis and so on and so forth, and then huge respiratory problems and uh, very frequent as well. So again, these are, uh, you know, hugely important variants, but the vast, vast majority of genetic variants in the human genome don't have a big effect. So how do we represent and store these uh, genetic variants? So as you know, every person has two copies of uh, the human genome, the one you inherited from one of your mom's two copies, the other one you inherited from one of your dad's two copies. So every one of us is deployed and we'll pass on only one of these copies as well to our uh, children. Uh, each individual carries two homo homologous copies of each chromosome and therefore we carry two copies of each variant. So when we talk about risk and non-risk individuals, well, that's for one of their alleles. You have to talk about both alleles. So very often we're gonna be talking about the genotype rather than the allele of a person. So basically, uh, you know, we're going to be calling these either maternal or paternal allele. And then the variants co-occur in the haplotypes, which are then inherited as a unit. So a haplotype is basically the series of nucleotides in the same chromosome that you inherited from the same parent, or at least that has now ended up in the same side of your two chromosomes. If you, for example, if your maternal haplotype is 00101010, then your genotype will be 0120120. So notice here that I'm no longer using ACGT. I'm assuming that every polymorphism has either the zero version or the one version. And we're asking here how many copies of the alternate allele did I inherit? Basically, there's the reference human genome. That means I'm reference, reference, alternate, reference, alternate, alternate, reference for the uh, maternal haplotype and so on for the maternal haplotype. And then here it basically says I'm homozygous reference, I'm heterozygous, I'm homozygous non reference, I'm homozygous reference, heterozygous, homozygous alternate, homozygous reference. Everybody with me so far? Yeah. It's, yeah, one of the common ways to measure that. Yeah. But it's the most common way. Okay. So basically now we can start talking about genotypes. And then, of course, when you carry out uh, a SNP array for a person, you don't get haplotypes. What you get is genotypes. So then you don't know whether you inherited one allele from mom or from dad. All you know is that, uh, you know, You've inherited two, one, or zero copies of the reference versus the alternate at any position. Um, any questions so far? Okay. So it is experimentally possible, but currently it's not very practical. It's too expensive to, inf to directly measure haplotypes over the whole genome. And you should also recognize that here I'm calling it paternal and maternal, but in fact, you know, you may have had a, you know, recombination event here and so, and so forth. Um, so it's not necessarily, um, actually, it is necessarily, but basically it's not exactly one of your mom's uh, chromosomes because mom's chromosome may have received, you know, grandpa versus grandma and have a recombination event here. So basically, this will not necessarily match your maternal, one of your maternal haplotypes, but it will match, you know, Basically, it will be a consequence of your maternal genotype. Okay, everybody with me here? So <clears throat> it is cheaper and much more efficient to measure genotypes, to basically simply count minor alleles 
using genotyping arrays. You basically have uh, microarrays that basically have, you know, two versions at every SNP, one matching the reference, one matching the alternate. Then you hybridize them, and then you see if you, in fact, uh, recognize zero, one, or both uh, alternate alleles. So basically, the genotype loses information, and you need algorithms to statistically recover that information. And that's what both phasing and imputation do. Okay? So basically, there's been a lot of effort to systematically catalog human variation by basically sequencing a lot of individuals to discover genetic variants and then cataloging common variants and also haplotype blocks. And we'll get much more into that in the next section. And then once you have cataloged these common variants, you can simply genotype many, many more individuals by simply remeasuring variants that you have already discovered. And then you can use that to estimate population-specific properties and then maybe refine your genotyping array for the specific population at hand and so on and so forth. There's been a lot of projects to do that. The two most important ones are HapMap, uh, the haplotype mapping project, and then uh, the Thousand Genomes project. So how do you discover these genetic variants in the first place? By sequencing. So you basically sequence using initially traditional Sanger sequencing and more recently next generation sequencing. You sequence a large, large, large uh, number of reads. You map them uh, to the genome and then you basically recognize places where these reads differ from each other and then you can call a variant there. So high throughput sequencing is very commonly used to measure molecular phenotypes such as gene expression and significations. Previously, we ignored mismatches and we simply matched reads that were very similar, but these might actually represent true sequence variants. So then you can uh, statistically distinguish true variants from simply errors in the sequencing, you know, using variant calling. And there's a lot of variant calling pipelines. There's been a lot of methods for that. One very commonly used one is the GATK um, Genome Analysis Toolkit, uh, Apotype Caller. It basically uses heuristics to find mismatches that are not simply explained by noise, and then uses an assembly graph to identify possible haplotypes. And then for each haplotype, it basically estimates the probability of obtaining a particular read given the haplotype using a probabilistic sequence alignment uh, model based on a hidden Markov model, whose states are insertion, deletion, substitution, whose emissions are pairs of aligned nucleotides or gaps, and then whose transitions are equivalent to the insertion, deletion, or gap penalties from your dynamic programming alignment algorithms that you have seen. And then what you end up with is the probability of observing a particular read, given a particular haplotype. And then you can use uh, you know, expectation maximization to estimate these uh, haplotypes from the observed data. And you can use Bayes' rule to basically uh, reverse the directionality of even that I know how to produce reads from a particular haplotype, I can now infer how to produce haplotypes, uh, you know, what haplotypes are more likely to have given rise to specific reads. And then I can assign genotypes to each sample based on maximum a posteriori haplotype. You can basically build a uh, you know, haplotype graph and then assign specific reads to these haplotypes and then you know, use a pair HMM to basically determine the per read likelihood and then uh, end up with uh, haplotypes. So that's at the level of common variants. Then for exomes, there's been also a lot of work in being able to resequence uh, exomes at high capacity. This is one way of identifying those rare variants that we talked about, because uh, exonic variants are very often have stronger effect. And then the motivation is that the exome has different sequence properties than the rest of the genome. Its substitution rates, uh, are different, its GC content is different. So uh, the approach there has been to train a logistic regression classifier to predict mismatches um, and classify them as errors or not, and basically which of these mismatches are truly variant. Uh, this has been trained on uh, a lot of data and then you know, used uh, true positives where the mismatch has been discovered in another independent project, true negatives using the remainder of the reads, and then the features are what is the quality score from the sequencing machine at the position of the mismatch, what is the quality score of the flanking bases, whether any of the neighboring uh, nucleotides were in fact in the incorrect order, what is the distance to the three prime end of the read, 
because sequencing reactions happen from the five prime end of the read to the three prime end of the read. The quality at the five prime end is higher. And as you get closer to the three prime end, the quality decreases. So you can use that as an additional uh, metric. So then these methods have been um, much faster than full Bayesian modeling and have uh, lower false positive rates. So this has been done systematically over the, you know, thousands of genomes. So uh, the thousand genomes project, for example, sequenced 2,500 whole genomes at low depth, about 4x, across 26 different populations spanning the globe in order to basically catalog human genetic variation. Yeah. That means that if I expect to get uh, 3 billion letters for the human genome, I'm going to sequence 12 billion letters from that person. How am I going to sequence that? If every read is about 100 bases, then I'm going to sequence 40 million reads. So. Uh, or you know, 120 million reads. So uh, the you know the idea there is that if I wanted to get a sequence of one person at extremely high quality, four x would not be sufficient because then in one position I would only have on average four reads, and some position will have only one, maybe another position more. Um, so you could basically say that I want super high quality single genomes, but the goal of that project was to identify ca and catalog human variation. Any one person contains only a small fraction of the total variation in the population. So you are better off sequencing, you know, instead of spending 30x capacity in one person, do 10 people with that capacity. And then you will discover many more variants. And then if you see the multiple in the multiple individuals, you're much more certain that this is a true variant rather than a somatic mutation or, you know, a sequencing, a systematically sequencing bias and so on. Any, or a PCR artifact. Any other questions? All right, so then that project basically developed not only a reference data set, but it brought together huge teams of statisticians to basically develop sophisticated statistical tools for uh, phasing and imputation, uh, to figure out methods to account for noise, for known patterns of variation, and uh, so on. And then once you've cataloged common variation by sequencing, most genetic variants in an individual will be recurrent in the population. And once they've been discovered and cataloged, you can just build a common SNP array for measuring them systematically. And then these, of course, DNA microarrays were the key technological advance of the 90s. They were initially used for measuring gene expression levels, but they now are primarily used for measuring genetic variation. So basically, um, fragments of DNAs uh, of DNA that have you know, a particular variant will hybridize either to one version or the other version, giving rise to a call that basically tells you uh, whether this person is more likely to contain the risk or the non-risk, the common or the reference, and so on. Sorry. The major or the minor as the reference or the alternate and so on and so forth. And this is still the main technology that's being used today across most US studies and also for direct-to-consumer services like 23 and and then the next goal is to study associations across populations. And then um, sometimes this will require new array designs that are specific to that population and that take advantage also of the links to the patterns across populations. Okay. So that's basically just introducing the variability in your genome. Basically, you know, SNPs, indels, copy number variants, structural variants, strong, uh, short term and repeats. How do we detect them? Uh, how do we all them from sequencing reads. Now let's talk about some uh, properties beyond individual variants. We're gonna talk about haplotype blocks for combination. So the first thing to uh, develop is basically methods for measuring whether two locations are independently inherited or not, okay? Mendel, uh, you know, for all the wonderful things he did, uh, made one major assumption, which was independent assortment. So he basically had his P's and he was measuring, you know, different phenotypes on those P's. And if he could map those phenotypes, you know, uh, as to how they were being inherited. And then every now and then the data wouldn't quite match. So he sort of fudged the data to basically, um, you know, truly show independent assortment. But it turns out that he had measured things more correctly than he realized. In fact, the measurements that he had were showing deviation 
from random assortment that were exactly indicative of co-inheritance of alleles that were sitting on the same chromosome, which of course was, you know, about 100 years ahead of his, of his time. So you can actually quantify that deviation from independent random assortment, and therefore the co-inheritance patterns of two alleles by calculating a coefficient of linkage disequilibrium between alleles A and B. So if you have two different alleles in uh, a particular locus, and you would like to know if they are co-inherited, then what you can basically ask is, you know, how often do I see, you know, one uh, combination versus another combination? Basically, you can calculate this uh, coefficient of linkage disequilibrium. It basically tells you, well, how often do I see P11, P00, versus basically how often do I see the haplotype, the haplotype 11 and 00, uh, minus how often do I see the haplotype 10 and 01. This is basically saying, if there was uh, any kind of bias, I would basically be able to capture it using this formula. Because this formula is basically saying, well, if they're independent, then the product P11 should be no more than P1 star times P star one. So basically at this locus inheriting, you know, version one or version zero at this particular location, if it's independent, I can simply compute that as, you know, the product of these independent uh, probabilities. And I can compute that as the product of independent probabilities. And I can compute that and compute that and if all of these products of independent probabilities are in fact independent, then that will become zero, okay? Raise your hands if you're with me on this one. Awesome, great. So basically, this is just a trick to basically say, am I deviating from zero, okay? And this is actually a property of the specific alleles and different alleles may actually have uh, different uh, If they are truly independent, then these B, equilibrium between uh, loci I and B will actually be zero. And linkage disequilibrium basically measures the degree of departure from Mendel's law of independent assortment. So if you find a non-zero value, that basically means that these two alleles are inherited in a you know, biased way. So basically, if you expect these particular haplotypes at this particular frequency, and you observe them at that particular frequency, then you can basically say, aha, there's linkage disequilibrium between these two uh, alleles in that particular locus. So how do we interpret these values? The problem is that, great, if it's zero, everybody knows how to interpret it. But if it's non-zero, then how do I interpret a 0 0.07 versus a 0 0.3? Is that a lot or little? The way to do that, because these numbers actually depend on the allele frequency, basically how common are these alleles, then what we can do is calculate a number d prime, which is a normalized d. How do you normalize it? By basically saying, what is the maximum linkage disequilibrium that I could possibly expect based on the allele frequencies of uh, these individual SNPs? And if I you know, calculate that, then you know, in this particular case, it's just simply you know, AB max is the product of zero star, star one, basically to these haplotypes. And then I can just normalize D by D max, and then I, I basically obtain 0.51, and that is directly interpretable. It basically says that I have 51% of the maximum possible disequilibrium between these pairs of alleles, regard, which is independent now of their frequency. Who's got any questions? Raise your hands if you're with me. Ah, sorry, this is one location, this is another location. This is one SNP, and this is, you know, some other SNP nearby. So basically, having zero star being, basically means that I've observed zero here, but I don't know what the other one is, I don't care. And that one, you know, 
So basically, E11 means that I inherited the 11 haplotype, which contains both observed values. Does that make sense? Thank you. Good question. Other questions? All right, <clears throat> that's one way of measuring it, basically by asking, uh, you know, this very simple metric of deviation from, you know, uh, zero. Uh, but that's not really a very intuitive metric. Uh, an alternative is to basically say, let's uh, measure effectively the correlation between these two positions, like how correlated are they? And you can define this correlation or the square of that correlation, R squared, as uh, you know, this D square that we saw previously divided by each of the probabilities of the alleles, and that gives you 37%. So that basically says that the square Pearson correlation of the two SNPs is actually 37. In practice, the Pearson correlation is very effect efficiently computed for all SNPs in you know, Windows. And then the Pearson correlation is also a very fundamental quantity for modeling GWAS z scores. In fact, the R square correlation for individual uh, pairs of SNPs is exactly the R square of the corresponding GWAS association summary statistic for these SNPs. So that basically means that when we, in the next lecture we talk about GWAS and having you know, an association uh, summary statistic for one particular SNP, if I know the R square of nearby SNPs, I can just extrapolate and calculate that for those, just because of the way that uh, correlation actually works. Okay? So that's another way of measuring linkage equilibrium or deviation from this uh, independent random assortment. So here's visualizing R square and visualizing recombination uh, events in a particular region across populations. So basically, um, Here's one uh, such um, uh, region, and here's another region. And you can see now this region in different populations will actually have different uh, structures. So what am I visualizing here? So if you look across the uh, horizontal line here, this is genomic positions. And then the red values that are you know, above that line are basically telling you what is the R square of two pairs of positions at the you know, end of this triangle, okay? Raise your hand if you follow this representation, awesome. Any questions? So that basically means that you know, this particular region is very heavily co-inherited, that region is very heavily co-inherited and so on and so forth. And that can actually vary across populations. For example, here, the haplotype block or the block of inheritance appears to be larger in uh, European individuals than in Chinese and Japanese individuals. Uh, and here, this particular region appears to be much less pronounced in Yoruban uh, individuals than in European individuals. Okay. So what causes these patterns? That basically means that this region here is co-inherited in the European population but uh, it stops being co-inherited after this particular segment, okay? So the boundaries between these segments basically tell you about where are recurrent recombination events that are occurring in the human genome across generations. And what you notice when you look at these patterns is that these recombination events are in fact happening in very specific hotspots, and that these hotspots are in fact sometimes different from population to population. The other thing to note is that these uh, red dots here don't represent the um, physical order or the linkage of SNPs in a chromosome. What they represent is the historical order in which mutations arose. So that's why it's not just a continuous measure, but there's gaps. For example, here, these regions are less correlated that's because that particular SNP arose later and then broke the nice haplotype block that you had earlier. So there, there can be SNPs and variations that arise after a haplotype block has been around for a while, and that will actually break the correlation pattern. Uh, and this is what leads to these sort of non-fully filled-in triangles. Okay, 
Cool. So what causes these uh, recombination hotspots? Okay. So what causes them is that across generations over and over again, recombinations appear to be in the same locations. To review a little bit of biology, this is very closely linked to the very process of meiosis. In order to line up the chromosomes that I will then send to the next generation, I have to make sure that I send a complete human genome and not just some quickly wrapped up thing that might contain, you know, multiple know, chromosomes 21, for example. So what I'm going to do is uh, line up the chromosomes during meiosis for gamete formation. And recombination basically starts with these double-stranded breaks that are then repaired by strand invasion of the homologous chromosome. So basically, I purposefully make breaks in my chromosomes, which then lead to repair by homology and then lining up all these chromosomes. And then half the time, these will be resolved in a you know, fashion that actually causes no crossover. And I will end up with a blue chromosome and a red chromosome end to end. And the other half of the time, I'm going to get a crossover. And therefore, I'm going to start you know, with a blue chromosome here and a red chromosome there, or a red chromosome here and a blue chromosome there. And what, what happens in the middle is also a little bit, a bit problematic. Basically, what happens in the middle is that I will repair this blue chromosome using the copy from the red chromosome in this particular case. And in this particular case, in those cases, it's a little more complicated. Basically, I will end up with some versions of copying blue on red or red on blue. Okay? So this can lead to gene conversion where I'm basically now having you know, two red copies instead of one blue and one red copy. And also recombination in this particular case where uh, I end up with blue leading into red and red leading into blue. Okay. Uh, this is actually thought to be the fundamental selective advantage for sexual reproduction. So basically you can repair places uh, in the genome that you know, were simply non-functional because you always have a functional copy sitting around uh, somewhere else. Okay. Everybody with me so far? So now, uh, where do these breakpoints happen? So basically, recombination does not happen uniformly over each chromosome. There's recombination hotspots, and these occur every 100,000 nucleotides, and recombinations occur hundreds of times more frequently in hotspots than elsewhere. And then mouse studies have revealed that this protein, PRDM9, is in fact instrumentally in demarcating these hotspots. So let's talk a little bit about how PRDM9 finds these hotspots. It basically has a motif that it recognizes. And it, it has a very long uh, protein domain with a stink finger array that recognizes this. And then it has uh, you know, all the right machinery for actually uh, recruiting the double-stranded now, why is this a tragic love story? So basically, uh, PRDM9 basically knows and loves a particular motif that it likes to bind. But the problem is that every time it finds that motif, it is destined by some horrendous uh, Greek god, I guess, to cut that motif. And that motif is then repaired by the other chromosome. Remember, the blue was cut and it was repaired by the red one. So if blue has a motif, that PRDM9 loathes and loves, it will be repaired by the red one and the motif will then disappear. So PRDM9 will basically start cutting the genome every time it finds the motif. And then that motif will disappear every time it catches it. And it will be repaired by homology to someone who doesn't contain the motif as often. So that basically makes PRDM9 the fastest evolving protein in the genome. Because if you start losing all your motifs, recombination doesn't work as well. The lining up of the chromosomes doesn't work as well. Your double stranded breaks doesn't don't work as well. And therefore, you end up not being very able to reproduce, which basically means that as the motif is getting lost, PRDM9 will now start recognizing a different motif. It doesn't matter which one. It just needs to appear a lot in the genome. 
But as soon as it now falls in love with a different motif, that motif will start disappearing. So it's a tragic love story of Pierre Duna. Everybody with me on this one? So now we can start talking about, you know, first of all, how are mutations occurring, how are recombinations occurring, and how are mutations passed on along these haplotype rocks. So let's now look at, uh, you know, one such region uh, of the genome. So this is uh, a paper by Mark Daly et al., who basically said, hey, we're going to go and study this particular region, which is involved in Crohn's disease. And we're going to basically see what are all of the potential haplotypes associated with Crohn's disease. And when Mark uh, and his colleagues did that, they basically realized that even though they had um, fully haplotyped 258 individuals, instead of finding 258 possible haplotypes, they found only a handful in any one region. Okay? They basically realized that the entire uh, diversity pattern of that very, very long region spanning, you know, uh, many of these, uh, you know, almost a megabase uh, segment, many of these genes, all of the genetic variants in that region could be explained by simply having, you know, a few haplotype blocks, which are then weaved together in some kind of threading. Okay? So that basically implies a very high level of genotype sharing, even for unrelated individuals. That means that you know, the human population is still a small little you know, sisterhood and brotherhood, rather than you know, these massive you know, six plus billion people on the planet. We are still just a small, you know, gang of 10,000 people that basically left Africa. And these haplotype blocks are in fact carrying the same, you know, polymorphisms in just a small number of versions. And the only way that these polymorphisms are broken are through these recombination hotspots and uh, rearrangements and sort of recombination events and through the arising of new mutations that then come in the context of ancient blocks. You basically have these ancient blocks that are still being passed on. Some of them are broke, broken up progressively over time. And then within them, new mutations arise. So you can then trace the history of the old mutations and the new mutations coexisting in the same space. So here's one example of how you can actually understand this region. You basically have you know, a phylogeny of uh, more like a demography of individuals, uh, you know, perhaps coming out of Africa and then populating Asia and Europe, and then maybe here staying in Africa and then going to Northern or Southern and so forth. And then you have mutations that arise over time. And then these mutations are basically occurring in the haplotype blocks that are associated with the different populations. And then you have these ancient mutations here in orange, and then you have younger mutations in uh, different colors that are happening in the context of those old Who's with me so far? Raise your hands. Great. So basically the HAPAN project, realizing this very unique structure, then set out to systematically catalog all haplotype blocks in the human genome. And um, this basically led to this fundamental knowledge that ultimately enabled genome-wide association studies, EPTL studies, and so on and so forth, by systematically cataloging uh, millions of SNPs and then studying multiple subpopulations, inferring haplotypes based on their co-inheritance patterns, and then uh, genotyping additional individuals to further uh, define okay. So a major, uh, so, who feels that they've learned something today? Good, good. So basically, this is very fundamental knowledge. And what's really remarkable is that this knowledge has only been around for the last few years. Anyone who studied you know, genomics or uh, genetics a decade ago didn't even know about this you know, pattern of haplotype blocks and their you know, 
crossing overs and even the existence of PRDM9 and these, you know, um, double stranded breaks and all that. I mean, the folks who established principles of human genetics and genetic inheritance, you know, like seminal work by Fisher in 1918, that preceded even knowing what the structure of the DNA was and what the genetic material was that actually carried out these genes, which were simply purely theoretical. So the fact that I can actually teach a class in 2018 and tell you the very molecular basis that leads to all of these subtleties about human inheritance is, you know, a, a very privileged moment in time when we actually have a lot of these building blocks that truly did not exist uh, even when these class started being taught. So anyway, I mean, it's, it's funny to, to have to just adjust the lectures year by year based on our completely renewed understanding. Uh, but anyway, it's kind of cool to sort of now understand all these very fundamental uh, processes. So now there's computational challenges that arise with all of that. So how do we phase haplotypes? So we, you know, we now understand a lot of what this is about, but there's still the challenge of, hey, I just genotyped myself or, or another individual, and then I, I find zero, one, two, zero, one, two, zero. Well, what's on one chromosome, what's on another chromosome? First of all, why does it matter? It matters because of compound, um, you know, lethal mutations. So basically that means that if I have a good copy and a bad copy of a gene, I'm probably fine because one working copy is usually okay. If my wife has a good copy and a bad copy of the same gene, she's also fine because one copy is usually okay. But when we have children, our children will have one fourth probability of inheriting the two good copies, which is false. Half, 50% probability of inheriting only one good and one bad copy from alternating between each of us, which is also fine, and a 25% chance of inheriting two bad copies. Now, if my wife and I were first cousins or something like that, that would likely be the same bad copy. And then, you know, we would be able to see it in a genotype, we would basically say, okay, that person has two bad copies. But if we're not first cousins, or if we're not sort of sharing that same bad copy, that basically means that our children will inherit a different good copy and bad copy, or two different bad copies in that last quarter uh, example. And looking at the genotype of our child, you might be able to say, oh, that child has one version of the gene that has two really bad mutations, sorry, or that child has actually two different bad versions of that gene. So basically, if say this here uh, is, you know, um, if this one includes a bad version and this one includes another bad version, I would like to know if these two bad versions are sitting on the same chromosome or on different chromosomes. Because if the two bad versions are actually sitting on the same chromosome, that's fine because that child still has a working copy. But if the two versions are sitting on different chromosomes, that's not fine because that means that both copies are broken. Who's with me on this one? Raise your hand. Awesome, great. So that's why phasing is so incredibly important because then it allows you to say, uh, you know, is this non-coding variant, for example, that causes this expression of this gene inherited in the same haplotype than that other variant that, you know, in the coding region, for example, that causes that gene to function correctly. So then the goal here is to resolve the genotypes into the underlying haplotypes. So basically figure out, you know, what did one uh, versus the other haplotypes look like. And that is a problem that actually requires auxiliary information and namely the parent uh, genotypes. So this is the most typical approach for phasing a particular set of variants, which is, oh uh, gosh, I think I lost my pointer. Guys, 
Yeah, he's back. Um, so basically, trio phasing is how you basically typically phase uh, the children. So you genotype the parents. You don't haplotype the parents because that's hard, but you genotype the parents, and then you genotype the child. And what you'd like to know is, you know, what does that look like? So uh, homozygocytes can be trivially phased. So if I'm homozygous zero or homozygous uh, two, you know, that's kind of trivial, right? So if I am homozygous zero here, I clearly inherited the zero from both parents. And then if I'm homozygous two, uh, then I must have inherited one from each other. Okay. It is the heterozygocytes that are difficult to recognize. So basically, if I inherited two copies of this particular SNP, or this alternate allele of this particular SNP, then that means that both parents gave me their alternate allele, regardless of what they are. But then for heterozygocytes, that's where it becomes more challenging. So then, um, the, you know, if at least one parent is homozygous, then, you know, there's simply no ambiguity left. So basically, if in this particular location, dad had no copies of the alternate allele and mom had one, it's clear that I got mom's copy. Okay. And again, there's a typo in the slide. Um, I heard somebody laugh. Um, if both parents are heterozygous, well, that's when we actually need some additional information. And that's where linkage disequilibrium comes in. So in this particular location, dad had a one, mom had a one. So that basically means that dad is zero in one chromosome, one in the other chromosome. Mom is zero in one chromosome, one in the other chromosome. It's unclear who gave me the one that I have. Raise your hands if you're with me. Awesome. Great. Okay. So then we're going to basically use uh, LD information, linkage circular information, to basically look nearby to say, well, what is more likely, uh, you know, to have uh, a reason to. Okay. So this is for phasing related individuals. And basically here, you know, by, by looking at uh, this 0, 0, 1, 0, et cetera, I can basically figure out what did mom give me, what did mom have at that location, and which haplotype is mom more likely to have. And is this particular haplotype that I got from mom more likely to be a common haplotype with a one here or a zero? Okay. So basically, knowing you know, the reference panel of haplotype blocks basically allows me to then infer what did I get from mom and what did I get from dad. So basically, at this point, I'm almost at the level of a particular haplotype, which basically then allows me to also go and haplotype the parents by basically phasing the uh, you know, child I then have additional information about the parents, which then allows me to infer which, uh, which particular reference I So I can do most of it simply by you know, these very simple rules. And then the remainder, I can just fill in by, by matching the resulting almost complete haplotypes with the reference haplotype blocks from 1,000 genomes and Okay, everybody with me? All right, so that's for phasing uh, related individuals. So, you know, most of the work you can do just by reasoning about the parents. For phasing unrelated individuals, basically I need to uh, probabilistically infer most of the information. So basically modern analysis very often consider collections of unrelated individuals and we don't have pedigree information. We can only use the patterns of leakage disequilibrium. So the input for these problems is phased haplotypes in a reference panel and then observed genotypes in a population sample. So the, observe, the unobserved haplotypes underlying the observed genotypes can be traced back to a common ancestor with the reference panel. And we're gonna talk about ancestral combination graphs. And then we can directly fit these ancestral combination graphs uh, for you know, smaller samples, but not for large samples. We have to approximate. And then the idea is we're gonna be generating each of the unobserved haplotypes by copying segments from the reference haplotypes such that the resulting genotypes match the observations. Basically, I have an underlying hidden set of haplotypes that I can sample from. This is a finite set, as we saw in the previous slide. There's only a small number of ancestral haplotypes at any one location. And then, as I'm going through explaining my genotypes away based on these haplotypes, I can basically say, what is the transition probability, i.e., uh, you know, recombination uh, breakpoint between 
one haplotype and the other uh, haplotype, a combination event. Uh, that's the transitions between these ancestral states. And then the uh, probability of the ancestral states themselves is simply you know, the hidden state that I'm in. Okay, so I can basically use a hidden Markov model that infers the most likely ancient haplotype that I'm in, in every position, and then infers the locations where I have to switch between ancestral haplotype blocks and other ancestral haplotype blocks. Who's with me on this? Raise your hand. Awesome. So that's basically for phasing unrelated individuals. And then uh, I can impute genotypes. So basically on one hand, I can phase the information. And then once I have phased it, I now have uh, you know, this and this and this and that known already on my haplotype. So then I can simply complete the rest of the information in trivial fashion, because I know which haplotype I used for, for uh, phasing. So then I already know what haplotype I have at every one location. So then I can fill in the missing information uh, based on the haplotype that I'm in. Okay? So the hard part is inferring the haplotype that I'm in. Once I have the haplotype, imputation is actually quite easy. Okay? So the, the huge advantage of uh, recognizing this haplotype structure of the human genome was that we could then use only a marker SNP for every haplotype. And then once I had that marker, I could then infer the rest of the haplotype. Okay? So then by having you know, two or three uh, genotype SNPs within a particular haplotype block, I can then infer which haplotype, which ancestral haplotype I have, and then fill in all of the other SNPs that I don't even need to go and observe in the population. So that's what, phenotype, that's what genotype imputation does. So basically the intuition is that the same haplotype copying model for phasing applies, and then you can phase alleles for genotype SNPs, and then also copy the alleles for the unobserved variants, and then recover genotypes by simply summing up the inferred haplotypes. I'm basically going from, from genotype to genotype, but I'm going through that through the intermediate of the specific haplotype that I have. Okay. Um, great. So basically, we talked about genetic variation at the level of individual SNPs, and then we talked about genetic variation at the level of haplotype blocks based on this recognition of the inheritance patterns. And these blocks are very, inter, uh, very closely intertwined with recombination events that happen during meiosis, with hotspots of meiosis, tragic love story of the PRDM9 protein that basically initiates these double-stranded breaks and then immediately loses uh, its motif. And then uh, measures of linkage to equilibrium, uh, definitions of haplotype blocks, phasing, and imputation. Everybody with me so far? Great. So now let's talk about what we can do with this uh, arsenal of tools that we have. So we can basically start studying identity by descent in related individuals. Basically, you know, as you know, every one of your parents had two chromosomes, one from their mom, one from their dad, and then passed on one of them to you. And so did uh, mom and so did dad. So basically parents share 50% of their DNA with their children, and then siblings share 50% of DNA with each other. Okay? But these are very, very different 50%. So every child with their dad shares exactly 50% of every location. Every child with each other shares either 0% or 50% or 25% of, or 100%, sorry, of each location. So how? So basically, this is a comparison between a parent and its child. In this particular case, me and my son. Um, when my son came out blonde, people say, oh, where did he get his uh, uh, hair color? And I would reply, oh, probably his dad. And uh, kept teasing my wife until she sent me this picture, basically, with no comments, simply saying, here's Jonathan versus Manon. So um, anyway, needless to say that 100% of Jonathan's genome was basically 50% uh, identical to mine. But this is actually a comparison between my genome and my brother's genome. And what you can see is that in about 50% of, of the genome, we share exactly 50% of our chromosomes. That's the places where you know, uh, one of us inherited one copy, basically where we both inherited the same copy from either mom or dad, but a different copy on the other side. In some places, we both inherited the same copy, both from mom and from dad, 
And in other places, we just inherited different copies. I got moms and dad, okay? Or I got basically mom's mom and he got mom's dad and uh, so on and so forth in, in both cases, okay? So they both average out to about 50%, but in fact, these 50% are very, very different. So, you know, uh, that's basically, you know, based on identity by descent then, uh, and, and for related individuals. But then, as you start going further in time, you can basically start asking, well, how many variants are shared by any two random people, not necessarily members of the same family? And what you can basically do is start asking, well, how many genetic variants are there in uh, you know, every population that the thousand genome throughout the past? And what you find is that as you vary from population to population, you basically have dramatic differences in the number of uh, variable sites. So, you know, African populations here have, you know, on average, uh, 5 million uh, variable sites, whereas European populations have on average only 4.1 million uh, variable sites. Why is that? Because African populations have basically stayed put and they have accumulated genetic variation over the entire history of the human population, whereas non-African populations basically went through a bottleneck. A very small number of individuals left Africa, capturing only a very small fraction of the total population of Africa. And then these individuals, of course, continued accumulating uh, mutations, but then they also went through bottlenecks. And that diversity was further reduced through you know, ice ages and so on and so forth. So, Every one of us carries about, you know, four to five million positions that differ uh, and two to three thousand structural variants, which affect about 20 megabases of the genome, and then hundreds of protein truncating variants. So being diploid basically means that we can tolerate hundreds of broken proteins in any one of us. And hint, don't marry your first cousins. Because, you know, chances are some of those will actually appear. Uh, and then we have tens of thousands of non-synonymous mutations. So African individuals have much more variation. Again, I mentioned one. The other thing to note is the uh, estimated population size at different points in time. So you can see here the very recent you know, expansion of um, the population size. And then uh, you know, how, as you go back through time, you basically have you know, uh, bottlenecks and so on and so forth. Basically, here is uh, present is here, past is there, and you can see here the expansion of the population initially. Uh, this is in Africa, and then getting, uh, you know, through um, some kind of population bottleneck, which is shared by all, and then different populations expanding in uh, different uh, scales in modern times. So you can actually start recognizing segments that are shared with different populations, and you can actually start painting uh, the chromosomes of any one person based on the population that it most closely resembles. You can see here an individual that is 80% sub-Saharan -Sub African, about 18% European, and about 2% uh, East Asian and Native American. Um, and you can actually start doing that using uh, these latent Dirichlet allocation processes that basically were initially proposed for document classification, whereby every document is associated with multiple topics. Uh, some documents are associated with multiple topics, depending on which words they contain. And then the individuals or documents, variants or words, populations or topics, and you can start assigning the words that you find most frequently in specific topics. So if your topic is Native American, here are the words that are associated with that uh, particular topic in orange here. And then if your topic is European, here are the words in blue that are associated with that. And then you can classify every region as to one of uh, each of these topics, depending on where you are in the genome. And you, know, you can infer that basically using uh, classifiers. So once, you know, if you do that on the thousand genomes uh, that were sequenced from the thousand genomes project, you can basically classify regions as being from different places. Like, you know, you have the brown regions and the, sorry, the, blau the brown haplotypes in, uh, you know, 
specific regions, but you get yellow haplotypes and so on and so forth from each of the different continents. But then what you realize is that, you know, for example, Japanese uh, individuals are very clearly, you know, East Asian, but then Chinese individuals are already admixed. So they are, you know, about half and half between East Asian and Central Asian and so on and so forth. So basically what you, what you see is that almost every person uh, in each of these quote unquote pure populations was an admixture. And even for Native American, you can see that, you know, there were simply no individuals who were 100% Native American. You could see clearly the Native American chromosomes, but they were always mixed in with, uh, you know, European ancestry and so on and so forth. So you can actually recognize these very broad patterns of variation by doing what we learned two lectures ago, which was principal components analysis. You can basically do a singular value decomposition of your data to basically recognize the major patterns of variation. And when you do that in a collection of European samples and you look at the first principal component versus the second principal component, you end up with something dramatic which is that the alignment of these samples on these two axes of genetic variation is in fact very closely matching a map of Europe where the colors of the samples correspond to the colors of the corresponding countries. So basically somehow, you know, genetics mirrors geography. And that actually makes a lot of sense. And the axis is slightly tilted which actually corresponds to the east-west and north-south migration patterns in the ancient uh, colonization of the European continent. It's quite remarkable, which basically means that even to this date, we can recognize these patterns of ancient settlements uh, going through Europe. Uh, and actually, you know, they make a big part uh, of our genome. The other thing to recognize is that phenotypically, we differ greatly from different regions of Europe to other regions of Europe. And part of that is actually environmental. You know, I don't know, it rains more here than it rains there, for example. And, you know, you have more snow here than you have there and so on and so forth. And um, that could actually impact phenotypic differences in, say, depression or, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, tolerance of sun and stuff like that. And not all of that is genetic. Some of that is genetic, but not all of it. So in order to account for socioeconomic factors and uh, you know, climate factors and other factors that can impact your genomic association studies, correcting for these principal components of variation is usually the first step that you take when you do a genomic association study. So basically recognizing the major forces that are driving these genotypes are in fact not functional, but in fact you know, they're, they're demographic. And you can actually start measuring uh, differences and divergence between populations. And um, you can actually start studying, you know, the patterns of change that different populations went through. Uh, the path that we took in migrating out of Africa through, uh, you know, these straits and down to uh, North America and South America. Recent migrations into different continents and subcontinents recent admixtures, uh, and you can even start studying ancient DNA, basically recognize the migrations of Denisovans and uh, Neanderthals. And you can actually start rewriting uh, human history based on uh, understanding these migrations. Uh, the other thing to, rec to recognize is that embedded within our genome are signals of ancient selection. So by recognizing the diversity in different parts of the genome, you can actually recognize evidence for selective events that impacted huge fractions of the human population. For example, you can look at the proportion of functional changes or the frequency of uh, rare alleles, basically recognize um, selective events that happened very uh, anciently. You can recognize the frequency of derived alleles uh, in different populations uh, to basically study more recent events. You can recognize the difference in allele frequencies across different uh, subpopulations. Basically uh, study uh, 
population differentiation, which is actually uh, evidence of adaptation of one population or both to different uh, environments. And you can also study the length of these haplotype blocks, basically infer a very recent selection. The idea is the following, that haplotype blocks were initially very, very large. And as you go through human history, these blocks are progressively broken up by recombination events. If you find a very large haplotype block, that basically means that it's a very recent haplotype block. And if you find short haplotype blocks, it means that they're more ancient. But now, new mutations within a haplotype block arise, as I mentioned, by chance within the history of that block. So if you find a very large block with few mutations, that's normal because that's a recent block and accumulated few mutations. But if you find a very large block with sparse, with, with many mutations, that basically means that some kind of selective pressure has been maintaining this block to be large, even though it has you know, clearly been around for a while based on the number of mutations that it has. So you can look at the discrepancy between the length of a haplotype block and the number of mutations in that block to basically recognize uh, signs of positive selection. So here's one example of uh, the lactase gene, which basically is sitting in a very, very long haplotype, even though uh, this is, you know, uh, basically this haplotype rose to very high frequency, even though it's, uh, you know, still very, very long. And there, there, what that basically suggests is that even though it's a young haplotype based on its length, its frequency suggests that it was positively selected not the number of mutations, but the frequency of the haplotype. You would expect basically long haplotypes, to be young and you know, they're relatively rare. But in this particular case, you know, what you can see from the relationship between the age and the length of the haplotype is that there was in fact a positive selection event happening in Europe. And that was basically with uh, agriculture and domestication of animals, you could basically have uh, milk production, providing a separate source of food, and therefore a mutation that actually caused the lactase gene to be expressed into adulthood, and therefore not be lactose intoler intolerant, which was a not normal thing, you could basically have that mutation now carry through the human population. So there has been now hundreds of these uh, regions of recent selection that have been detected, and they have all kinds of uh, very, very interesting functions uh, across the human population. So that's where I'll stop today to basically talk about, um, you know, the basis of population genomics, genetic variation, where it comes from, haplotypes and how they are evolving across, uh, you know, history, and then uh, human relatedness and ancestry painting, demographic history, and lastly, using different measures of population genetics to infer selection at different time scales. So we'll talk again on Thursday to talk about GWAS.